thanks for your kind invitation to come here today. It's a real pleasure to uh, talk about a, a topic that's uh, really been my whole career. And it's of as much interest to me today as it was the first day I started. I love getting up to go to work every morning, every day. And every day feels like my first day of work. So, um, so I'm really pleased to, to share um, some of my experiences with you. I also want to congratulate everyone here who's a Queen's uh, master's or PhD student. Um, um, I don't spend a lot of time here in your program, but I do see the outcomes of your program because I run into graduates all the time in my, bus in, in my work over the years. And so there's two things that sort of come to mind when I think about the Queen's graduates that I've met with their work. And so uh, one is that um, they have a real rigor in terms of uh, how to do uh, uh, public policy. And, um, and, and, uh, and rigor really matters over the long term. And the second is, is that I've always observed a kind of optimism in the Queen's uh, graduates that I work with. And I think uh, rigor and optimism together is exactly what people need in order to have strong careers, um, you know, making and working in the pu public policy area. So congratulations to all of you that are engaged in such a great program. Um, so um, I'm going to focus my, so first of all, this is like an impossibly complex topic all around, like if you want to talk about everything in veterans health and policy. So I'm going to focus on two things today. Um, uh, one, I'm going to try and take a stab at making some high level observations about it, since it's the armistice of the First World War, to talk about some of the main themes in veteran policy over the, that, that have sort of been constant over the last uh, century. and. Um, so, 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 so the buyer beware in that part of the discussion. So it's not peer reviewed, it's my observations, but I will say that I did check with two of sort of Canada's best historians in that area to ask them if I'm sort of on track with this. And they thought that, you know, I wasn't way off base that I was on track, but, but still the buyer beware. And then the second part I'm gonna talk about is I'm just gonna focus on one strand of this sort of complex thing that's gone on for a century. And that's that one question, it's about whether, um, uh, so there's two ways of framing it. What is what is the life like after military service? And a more complex question is, what is the impact of military service on health? So I'll show you that that's also been part, that's been one strand of like a multi-complex uh, number of issues in the veteran policy space. But it's one that I've done some work on, and so it's one that I think I can, I can speak to, um, but it remains an important one. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the definition of a veteran, because I'm using that term. And that's, first of all, to tell you that there's no uh, accepted definition of veteran anywhere, not in, not in Canada, not in the United States, not in Australia, not in the UK. Everybody has a different idea of what, of what, of what veteran is. So sometimes they're called service leavers, leavers in the UK. Sometimes they're called ex-service in Australia. Um, I'm going to use veteran, though, in the term that Veterans Affairs Canada uses it as that's any former Canadian Armed Forces member who released um, any time after enrollment. And just to give you an example, this, this, this term veteran actually does have real world implications. It's not just a, um, you know, an idea. So I, so I started as a clinician and case manager working directly with veterans for the first few years of my, of my career. And... Um, uh, so I still have contact with, with, with veterans quite frequently, um, though most of them are younger veterans, they're more contemporary right now. So I still run, so I do run into people and I say, uh, I, I find out about their transition experience, what they're up to, and I find out they have problems. And I say, well, have you gone to the Department of Veterans Affairs or Veterans Affairs Canada to apply for benefits? And they say, well, no, I was never deployed. So I really don't consider myself to be a veteran. So, so thankfully, uh, most of these people have gone on and applied for benefits. But just to show you, though, that this whole thing about what a veteran is can matter, and it can matter uh, to people about whether they're um, getting the benefits that they, that, that they, that they deserve. Um, so now I'm going to move on to this um, sort of bigger topic area that, that I will um, sort, of, um, sort of put some caution to because these are, these are really just my views. Um, although I did sort of check on them to make sure that I'm not way, way off base on them. So I thought that there were really three themes if you wanted to look at, uh, to think about this veteran challenge that Canada has faced as, as, as a, uh, um, in totality over 100 years, what would be sort of the three big things that you'd want to think about? Um, so one, of course, is that um, for a variety of reasons, veterans in Canada, they have a special status. So um, they're a federal responsibility, they're a federal department. That's partly because of the 
contribution that we owe to veterans, but it's also historical. It's because of the size, the magnitude of the challenge, not just at an individual level of dealing with veterans when they transition from military service to civilian life, but that um, these can be societal challenges as well. As well. And that was the case after World War I and World War II, when you started having hundreds of thousands of people who, were, um, who served and were, and were, were released. Um, but there's one of the many programs that have been developed. Well, I, I'm also going to mention that uh, from my point of view, there's probably in, in, in the content of veterans programs, there's pro in many ways, there's probably nothing unique about them. Uh, that income support, uh, rehabilitation, disability compensation, they're programs that can be done anywhere. But because veterans have a special status, they're put in a separate box and called uh, veteran benefits. So I just wanted to mention that. And of the many programs that have been developed over the past century, probably the most important one that came out of World War I is disability compensation. So that's a program where you have to connect um, military service to a health condition as a requirement for eligibility. So that in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad way to do compensation. But where it, where it can get more tricky and limiting is that if you use that as a gateway to all of your other programs, and, f and in many cases, that's been the case over the past century. So, um, so there's some disadvantages to that. Um, so I want to be clear here. I'm not saying a disability compensation program isn't a good thing. But there are challenges, though, if you want to use it as a gateway. So if you want to use it as a gateway, say, to health care benefits, it might mean that if someone has a health care program, they have to go through a lengthy medical disability attribution process before they can get health care support. So it doesn't necessarily make for a nimble process, and it doesn't necessarily make for um, a welcoming experience for some veterans because it's very personal when people come forward with a health condition they attribute to military service and it gets turned down once or gets turned down twice or they have to go through lengthy processes in order to seek uh, eligibility. So um, one, one of the things it has done though is it's sort of one of the ways that Canada has limited its liability in terms of how many people uh, are veterans, uh, that have veteran status uh, from the perspective of, of a department like Veterans Affairs Canada. So about 18% of the current generate, the, tr the current group of contemporary veterans would be Veterans Affairs clients, and it would be how we draw those lines, which is sort of what pol policy is all about. So, so dis disability compensation is one way to do it, um, but, uh, but, there are, but there are certainly disadvantages, um, probably from a veteran point of view, around using that as a gateway. The second one that I would consider a really big theme has been this challenge around um, transition from military service to civilian life and reestablishment in civilian life. So uh, that's both at an individual level that I'll talk later, but it's also at a societal level. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we, as we go through this. And then the third theme that I think is really worth underlining is the role of advocacy in the veteran space. So advocacy sort of bloomed after World War I. Um, World War I, it, I probably the transition of um, the, the you know hundreds of thousands of members who served in World War One was probably viewed as a failure by many in terms of the government response to uh, to the challenges of World War One veterans faced when when they came home, and uh, between the wars that led to um, a real expansion of um, of veteran advocacy, which is just as pertinent and important today as it was then. Um, if you watch the news, you'll probably see veteran issues and veterans themselves playing a big role in uh, how we identify issues, how we prioritize them, and um, how we solve uh, veteran problems. And that has to be usually in collaboration with the, with, with, with the advocacy community in, in Canada. So, so for me, those are three really big things that I'd want people to know about if, it, uh, if they wanted to think, well, you know, what are some of the really uh, important things uh, to think about um, in veteran policy over the last year? And then make no doubt about it. All of this has had big impacts, uh, both in the Canadian identity and in nation building. Um, that's in um, uh, both in institutions and novel problem, no, novel programs. So hospital systems were built through World War I and World War II. You know, a federal department was created. Um, healthcare systems were developed. Unique uh, income support programs, the War Veterans Allowance that was developed in the 1930s, would have been one of Canada's uh, sort of first um, 
uh, income support programs that was national and set an example for later programs like old age security. Uh, the, war vet the, the Veterans Independence Program that was developed in the late 70s and, through the, and, and implemented through the 80s. It was one of the best and still is probably one of the best aging in place programs in the world and was a truly creative program when it was developed in the, in the 1970s. Um, thousands of health professionals were trained in veterans uh, hospitals and um, and uh, there was a lot of transfer and innovation between uh, um, healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare innovations that were transferred to the to the civilian sector. So, um, so really, this is is a big deal. So, I just wanted to have this show to show you a little bit about this magnitude issue. Um, that that um, that that when that that things will have a really big impact when there's a lot of people, and that's that. This is the number of people who were uh, regular force personnel by year from 1914 to 2006. So I really just wanted to underline the magnitude of the challenges that, say, a small country like Canada would have faced in, um, uh, in 1919. Um, after 650,000 Canadians had served in a country of 8, 8 million, with 250,000 uh, who were either uh, 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 wounded or killed. Um, so just to give you some size, and this was during a period when Canada's social welfare framework would have been really in its infancy. So, so, um, so this is how you come up with, so this is one of the ways that, reasons why you start building institutions that are national and focus when you have problems that are this big and they can't necessarily be addressed with a local or provincial response, even though that may have been the way that uh, British North America Act was written, that the, that, 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 that the exigency, the volume of need and the issues were so high that, that uh, Canada had to go beyond where it had been in terms of how it would address these problems. And similarly with World War II, where you had almost a million people in uniform. And... Um, uh, and, uh, the, and the new Veterans Charter, which was the major piece of legislation that was developed to help with transition from military s service to civilian life. Um, so if you look at that in retrospect, I think people would say that uh, World War I was a bit of a bomb, that Canada failed. It was a period of failed expectations, that, um, that there were great expectations from those who were served about things that would happen when they got home, and many were bitterly disappointed. Um, I think only about 5% at that time, after, at the end of the war, had uh, been granted military uh, disability compensation, so a very small percentage. And, uh, and most of the others got like a one-time payment to help them uh, in, civili in civilian life. Um, World War II was a different story. The new Veterans Charter is viewed by many as one of the best sort of comprehensive uh, social policies that have ever been developed in Canada. One thing that made it different is was actually it was designed by World War by by World War One veterans who had evolved into positions of power by that time, and they wanted to make things different for uh, for 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 World War Two veterans, and they did. In fact, the planning for uh, for for uh, release in World War Two was um, started in 1939. So comprehensive and meticulous planning started from the beginning. So this is maybe what I'm talking about, about rigor in, in policy making. And so rigorous uh, inputs re resulted in rigorous outcomes. And then of course, there's the new Veterans Charter that some of you may know about from 2006. And that followed the difficult uh, decade of the 1990s, uh, very, very difficult um, military operations into the war in Afghanistan. And, uh, and so I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, as you may know, there's a lot of public discussion and debate about the new Veterans Charter. And um, so, um, so, so a lot of effort has been, is, has been put in and has been being put in to, to uh, assure that the new Veterans Charter achieves its goal and works for the um, contemporary veterans. So that's a little, so that's sort of my shot at um, giving you a big picture um, about uh, veteran policy. Um, this is Canada's military today, um, about 649,000 veterans, World War II veterans rapidly declining, average age 93. At one point, uh, in certain age groups, all, uh, almost one half of Canadian men had served. So just to give you a sense of the of the impact of military service after World War II. We followed, uh, a lot of veteran policy was really about following that group 
that were all born within about five years of each other across their life course. So a lot of policy and program development followed that group. And then since then, um, the focus has been on contemporary veterans. That's post-World War II. Uh, that range back to peacekeeping operations after World War II um, through the, the difficult deployments of the 1990s and, and into uh, Afghanistan. But let me go back. So when I talked about um, this uh, circumscription around how we define eligibility, at the bottom there, over their lives, about 42% of um, World War II or Korean veterans uh, became uh, Veterans Affairs clients. And of the current generation, I think it's actually 18 percent, but uh, that it's either 16 or 18 percent. Excuse me if there's an error there. Um, so, um, um, so, 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 um, but but again, that gets back to how we define this gateway. So there is definitely a gap between um, the percentage of veterans that are clients of Veterans Affairs Canada and the public's perceived responsibility of a department like Veterans Affairs to do its work. In other words, many Canadians would think that. Um, um, they're legislatively responsible for all veterans, but in fact, um, m many veterans are well, so they don't necessarily come forward for programs, but some veterans will come forward and they won't qualify uh, to be eligible. So, so I just wanted to highlight that, um, that difference around the scope of legislation and how it impacts uh, the percent that are actually um, uh, clients of the, of the department. Um, and now we're uh, moving into um, a new era. So, um, so the Afghanistan cohort is the second biggest uh, following, um, following World War II. They're about twice the size of the Korean veteran cohort that were around 27,000, a little, little less than t uh, twice the size. Um, um, in 2014, and I haven't updated this, but most of them are still serving. So we're still about to see what's going to happen coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, what we do know is that there were higher rate, that there were higher rates of mental health issues coming out of this population. And um, in some studies I'll talk about in a minute, we've learned more about um, um, uh, that that um, that recent releases are making up um, um, the increase in people experiencing difficult disability, and that might be linked to to Afghanistan. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a second. This is another important slide. This is um, the period of time it takes from when people leave the Canadian Armed Forces to getting their first um, medical disability connection between service and health outcome decision. So first of all, it shows that 25% um, come forward before they leave, and that's due to policy uh, legislative changes that were made that enabled people to apply for uh, a disability award or pension before they left the Canadian Armed Forces. So that was actually a big change. Um, and then um, about half come forward within uh, 15 years, uh, but another half come forward 20, 25 years, 35 years, 60 years after service. So. Um, so, so the issue around how veterans attribute health issues to military service, um, that isn't something that just happens when they're leaving or just a few years after they're leaving. People think about health and military service across their entire lives and come forward uh, with concerns about, about impact. So, um, so I just wanted to highlight that. So when we're thinking about Afghanistan, for example, really we're talking about the rest of the century that, that we're expecting. Uh, veterans of Afghanistan or serving members from Afghanistan to come forward. And this pattern um, is, 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 is the pattern that goes back through World War I. This pattern doesn't look like it's something that's changing. Veterans are always thinking about their health when they have a problem and its connection to military service. So now let's move on and talk about the second topic I was going to talk about. And that was really around this issue around, um, well, is the health of um, Canadian Armed Forces veterans different than other Canadians in comparison. And, um, and um, well, may maybe that means there's an impact of military service on health that lasts, uh, that, that lasts, you know, that, that is addressed through the lifetime, through the life course. So um, the second question is harder to answer because I don't have data that follows people over time, um, but it's suggestive but, but the data we do have is suggestive, so we, can, um, so we can move forward with this question. But first, I'm going to go back to World War I again, 
because there's really an interesting story about World War I, and part of this is around the continuity of, of, of veteran experience um, across the last 100 years. So this is an interesting paper. This is a really, really sophisticated paper that was written by a guy named Dr. Burke and published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1939. And um, he actually had sort of the same job I did, which made it of great, even of great, greater interest to me. But um, between World War I and World War II, this theory developed. It was a Canadian theory that actually got picked up by other countries. And it was really a, a real force in terms of building veteran policy. And it was called the theory of pre-aging. And the idea was that the wear and tear of military service, um, and they all, and many people experienced World, World War I, which was an extraordinarily difficult um, military operation, as we all know. And there was a theory that developed that the, that, the, that the mental stress, the physical wear and tear, the training, the challenges would uh, cause um, um, what they called pre-aging. So, so th I guess theoretically that could be that they were worn out or burned out was another way of saying it. And um, so that could affect morbidity, but it could also affect mortality. So this guy named Burke. Uh, really did a really sophisticated paper, and he looked at this problem, and he did a really good mortality study, you know, about 20 years after World War I, where he compared uh, war pensioners with other Canadians to see if they had the same life expectancy. And um, so what he found was is that there wasn't much difference in life expectancy between um, uh, war pensioners and other Canadians, and he expected that we would see a difference. Um, 20, but 20 years later, we would probably be able to start to see a difference. So, um, so that sort of, uh, so he sort of felt that uh, this theory of pre-aging uh, was probably mostly conjecture. Um, and just to mention that this theory didn't didn't die; it continued and uh, found itself in departmental training materials uh, well into the 1980s. So this idea of a burnout um, was a was a theme. Uh, right through the 1980s in terms of how veteran health was was defined. So, um, but I just want to underline here that he looked at mortality, not morbidity. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because I'm not going to I'm not going to say that we should adopt a theory of pre-aging, but this kind of question has been one that's been going on since the beginning. And I'm going to come back to that later uh, because we've done mortality and morbidity studies now. Um, I wanted to make this a point of uh, a point of contrast. Um, so, um, so there has been a lot of research studies that could help us answer the question that I've posed, um, and that started in the 1970s, but, it, but it's really sped up since 2000, partly because the technology around doing population health studies has improved, um, because the interest of organizations like Veterans Affairs Canada and evidence-based decision-making has also increased. And um, I think there's also been, at least in my career, um, a, a greater willingness for transparency. There's a transparency gap that organizations have to cross over in order to do these kinds of studies, to do big mental health studies on their populations. And you can see organizations, whether they're in the first responder community, veteran or military co community, you can see that there's kind of a, a learning curve around being uh, ready to do these kinds of studies and, and deal with the outcomes. And I'm happy to say that that's really um, improved impressively over the past two decades. So, so um, and secondly, there's this question around, well, how do you do this kind of work and how should we, how should we look at, 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 at veterans? So this goes beyond research. It really is a way of approaching policy as well. So, um, so the way we focused on that, which has actually found its way into the way Veterans Affairs Canada looks at things, and increasingly into things like the new defense policy, is this idea that we really have to look at the whole life course of veterans, not just the mission when they're serving, uh, not just when they're finished. Um, and we also have to look at before as well, that if we really want to understand veteran and military health, we have to look at the whole picture uh, that would be the life before service, the transition into military service, the transition out, and the life after service. Um, because if we look at all these together, um, we're able to um, intervene earlier in life for outcomes that we see later in life. And that it also means that um, we understand more about the consequences of things that we do when people serve for um, for the outcomes, outcomes, outcomes later. So I think we have to think about those liabilities um, 
And then also, um, um, I think that there's advantages for recruitment and retention. If people know that we're thinking this way, if, if people know that this is the way we're looking at the problem, that we're looking at making sure that well-being is something that's important across the life course. Um, and um, those are the domains of well-being that we measure. So uh, I won't go through those in detail. They're on the left -hand side. Employment, finances, health, life skills, social integration, housing, physical environment, cultural environment. So this is kind of a superordinate concept of well-being that, that I'm talking about here. Um, that has been developed over the past decade and is now being, being uh, really quite widely used. Um, just to talk a little bit more about these studies, um, the lead on these studies was, it was Veterans Affairs Canada. I used to be director there. I'm not anymore, so I'm no longer the lead on these studies. Um, um, and, um, but they were groundbreaking in the sense that they're truly population-based. That means that they go back and look at everyone who's released since 1998. So uh, population-based studies have a, are, are very strong in their design because it can tell you the whole story about, about, about populations. Um, so, um, so, so the body, this body of work included um, um, large-scale healthcare studies that, 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 that were the basis of surveys, um, mortality and linkage studies that I'll also talk about, and um, and the uh, healthcare studies have focused on transition as well. And there's also the possibility to link with Revenue Canada data. So you can actually go back to 1998 and look at the sources uh, and changes in income for, for these populations. So it's a tr really a tremendously powerful uh, way of doing, um, doing health research. Um, so this first slide, um, is it's, about, it's about rank. And I don't want you to focus too much on it, but what I wanted to do to say is that later when I show a few other slides that rank is really a big deal um, in, in uh, understanding the well-being of military and veteran populations. It's, 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 it's kind of like a socioeconomic, um, it's, there's a soci socioeconomic effect probably across, across these populations. So generally speaking, um, the, um, the outcomes of military service or the experience in the life after service is more difficult for uh, non-commissioned members versus, versus commission members. Um, that's probably because the nature of the work they do is more, uh, more, more physical in nature. Um, but there's probably also predetermining factors as well. So I just wanted to mention the importance of rank in anything that we talk about. Um, these are some demographic characteristics. The main point here is that um, um, when most veterans leave the Canadian Armed Forces, they don't they don't retire. They go to the workforce, not the golf course. You know that kind of thinking. Um, so most of them are still working age, and they transition looking for employment and looking for work. Um, most are still males, um, about 87 percent. Most are married. Um, most, including non-commissioned members at this point in time, are, uh, have at least high school education, so they're relatively well-educated. And I'm going to talk more about income in a few minutes. Um, this is a slide on ease of adjustment to civilian life. So this is one that's been done across three, three surveys now. In the most recent one that was released, um, so, so, so well, let me just say here, um, first of all, most veterans report an easy adjustment. That, that, that even though there are challenges in transition, um, most felt when they think about it, uh, when they answer survey questions, that, 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 it, that it wasn't too bad that they got through it okay. Um, but about one third report that adjustment is, is difficult or very difficult. And um, so the more we've looked at transition across, across time, the more we realize that transition really is a time of vulnerability. And um, some of the dimensions of that vulnerability can be for those who are medically released, although it's really important to note that about 60% who had difficult adjustment were not medically released. So if all you do is target the medically released, it's not necessarily a bad place to start, but you're not going to be addressing um, most of the problem. Um, second is a small category, smaller category called involuntary release. Um, they tend to be less than 20 years of service when they're vested in, uh, in um, superannuation. 
more likely to be non-commissioned rank, more likely to be army. But the issue of identity and purpose is really, really an important issue for this population. Um, uh, you know, um, the transition into the military and into military culture is really a major turning point in most people's lives who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. And so leaving the Canadian Armed Forces and the culture and the social cohesion and the military lifestyle can be really a dramatic change for many. And um, so part of it is, is the loss of connection with people they, they know and have spent time with. But it can also be uh, differences in leadership working in civilian uh, employment environments. So this is a really important slide because I talked earlier about this question of health. So, so, this, is, um, so this is a comparison to the Canadian general population across um, uh, a wide range of chronic health conditions. So the red bars are mental health. The blue bars are physical health. And um, the bars to the right are the Canadian population. So there's a couple of things I wanted to highlight here. Um, the first one is that um, it's physical health conditions, not mental health conditions that predominate. Um, so physical health conditions that are musculoskeletal in nature are the ones that are the ones that really predominate. So that's arthritis, back pain, chronic pain. Um, those are the those are the health conditions that predominate. Mental health also is important, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But but uh, but uh, but if you read the media and get the press, you'd think that trauma is all about um, it's all about mental trauma. But, but it's not. It's about wear and tear and physical trauma as well as mental trauma. So, so, uh, so please, bear, please bear that in mind. Also, the um, chronic health conditions are about two to three times the, the level of, uh, of, of uh, Canadian population when controlled for age and sex. So, um, so, um, so this, is, this is like a, a very important slide for understanding how veterans are different than the Canadian population. So let's explore this whole issue a little more about the relationship between physical and mental health. So, um, so I guess the, the key here is that in this population, they overlap. Um, mental health is important and physical health predominates, um, but 90% of those with a mental health condition will also have a physical health condition. So when we think about this population, I don't think we want to think about mental health versus physical health. We want to think about them together. Um, so this is another very important slide because this is about activity limitation. Because if you're talking about well-being, it's really about how well people are doing, how well they're functioning in their day-to-day -day life. So this is a measure of activity limitation at home, school, work, and other settings. So you can see that in these series of studies, um, uh, veterans have about a two to three times higher level of limitations across homeschool work and other settings. So this is around when that picture that I showed you earlier around chronic conditions, how, that, how, the, how the rubber hits the road in terms of how well people are, are, are functioning. And then, and then um, this shot slide is about factors associated with activity limitations, but really what I want to highlight here is chronic pain. Because chronic pain that I showed in the earlier slide, the one with the bars, was also much higher in veterans. Than, uh, and chronic pain is a, is a, um, can be a, um, an outcome of musculoskeletal conditions, but, um, but it's also a pathway to mental health conditions. So I think when you think about this population in terms of how we define their health and how we define they might, how they might be different, we actually have to look at physical health, mental health, and chronic pain. You're more likely to be looking at those three things together, uh, both in terms of how you define what the challenges are in those populations, but also in how we think about how we may want to intervene to, uh, to, to, um, to seek um, a care for this population. So mental health, physical health, and chronic pain, and how they, and how they overlap are especially important when we're approaching healthcare in this population.
Um, so another thing that, that we, we spent about 10 years working on was this vexing question um, about um, suicide and a uh, uh, veteran suicide. So, um, so this became a high profile public domain issue uh, after the year 2000. And um, so there were, there was repeated interest in um, being able to address what is the, you know, what are suicide rates? How do veterans compare to other Canadians? So now there's been two really large scale studies that have been undertaken on this question. One was in 2011, and that looked at, uh, that was a very comprehensive study that looked at um, everyone who enrolled from 1972 to 2006. And it found that while there were lower mortality rates than the general Canadian public, and so, and, and so um, um, suicide risk over the 35 year period was about 1.46 times, about one and a half times higher uh, than it was for uh, for Canadian men. So, um, so then there was a second study undertaken that was released in 2017, and I would have been the sort of the co-chair of, of both of these projects. Um, and um, that one looked at everyone who released, which included much more, many more people, because if you looked at everyone who released from 1972, you'd be going back to people who enrolled much earlier. So it was a much larger um, population-based study that went from 1972 to 2012. So it found that the rate of suicide for men was about 1.4 times higher, very similar to the first study. But for the first time, we had enough people to look at women as well. So women was actually higher, it was 1.8 times higher. Um, and it was men under 25 that were most likely to be at higher rate of suicide at two and a half times. But men over 55 had a lower rate. They were actually equal or lower. So, so, um, so basically this pattern of um, mortality rates being the same or lower overall, um, uh, but except for suicide, and I just showed you earlier the slide of morbidity that would be around chronic health conditions being much higher. Um, so, um, so now the, I'll just go through some slides quickly here as we move forward. Um, this is to show that the unemployment rate is about, has been about the same, and that's been constant through, this, through, through these studies, um, about equivalent to the Canadian population. Um, but the, the rates of low income amongst veterans compared to non-veterans is much lower. So um, veterans had about half the rate of low income of the Canadian population, and they were very low users of social assistance. Um, that's a graph of what an income transition looks like. I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, except that there is a drop when they leave the Canadian Armed Forces, and it takes about 68 years to, to, uh, to recover from that drop. But there are some groups that don't that don't do as well. So those are those are younger men. Um, um, those who are medically released. If you're medically released, there's been studies done to show that the persistence in the gap between the, the drop in low income, which is about 20 percent, um, persists over time. Um, and um, and also women have a substantial gap when they leave as well. And the causes of that are not. Are not are not perfectly clear, but but they also have a substantial drop in the in the 15 to 20 percent range. So while um, while overall um, many Canadian Force armed, armed Forces veterans do well in the area of income, and in the in area of low income, um, there are um, subgroups um, that that uh, require our attention. Um, this is another shot looking at employment. And here I wanted to point out that even though the employment rate is about the same, when there's uh, asked to report about activity limitation at work, it's about three times higher. So it might mean that there's more tenuous em employment or there's more cause for um, uh, supports in, in the workplace. Um, also, there is a tendency for there, a greater likelihood to not be in the labor force. Um, so families have also emerged as a really high priority uh, both in the work that we've done at Simber over the past decade, um, but it's also grown in importance at Veterans Affairs and the Canadian Armed Forces. In fact, it's one of the um, it's one of the major themes in the new Canadian defence policy: strong, secure, and engaged. Um, families aren't just an issue; they're they're actually a priority. Um, so, um, a couple of the issues that we think about when we think about families are um, 
um, the impact of mobility on access to health and curricular gaps for children as a priority area to reduce those gaps. Um, and in terms of the costs of um, challenges for, 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 um, for families, um, there's been quite a bit of work done on the impact of caregiving. And so um, because um, of, you know, a percentage of the veteran population will be war injured and require um, family members to play long-term caregiving roles. The studies that have been done on those have shown very, very high uh, impacts, um, both in, in terms of um, opportunity costs, isolation, burden of stress, and worry. And um, we are also learning more about special issues in mental health, um, families that have um, family members with PTSD as also being uh, facing extraordinary challenges. So from a policy perspective, though, the biggest thing that's been going on in the family area has been this thing that we would call derived eligibility. And that means that families um, have not been considered uh, sort of a priority in their own right, um, nor have we been able to address their needs directly for the most part. Um, the eligibility for the family member sort of legislatively has had to be derived from eligibility for the veteran. And so what that has meant is it's meant that it's been difficult to serve families for that reason, but it's also meant that when it is done, um, you have to spend a lot of time doing sort of policy and legal gymnastics in order to bend things around so that it's possible to help. And I can speak sort of firsthand that um, uh, when you go in and see family members, uh, when, you're, when you're a case manager, um, part of the interest in helping families has come within the organizations themselves who find themselves at sort of at uh, um, not having enough tools to support family members in the kind of work they're doing supporting families. So, so we're hopeful that I think there's generally hope that um, uh, now that families are um, recognized, we know more about the experiences they have, that um, the next decade will be an opportunity to really make progress in terms of um, how we can serve families. And I'm really very optimistic about that. Um, so you might ask, well, what about reserves? So I'm just gonna sort of really quickly go over um, Canadian Armed Forces reserves. As you know, reserves have, as you probably know, through Afghanistan, Canadian Armed Forces reserve members have played a more and more important role in um, active force activity. And um, so one of the questions is, you know, what is the well-being of, 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 of um, reserve force members and um, what is their transition like? So this question has, has not been answered in the same depth that we've answered questions around uh, regular force members. But um, this, is, this, this is a look at chronic conditions across those populations. And so generally speaking, what we find is, is that uh, reserve reservists who are called Class C reservists, in other words, they're reservists who are deployed, they tend to look a lot more like um, regular force veterans in terms of their pattern of chronic health conditions uh, versus reservists who are in the um, other category, uh, the other two categories of reserves. Um, some of those will be students and some of those will be reservists who work on contract contracts who are part-time sometimes. So they all serve, they all serve Canada, they're all important. But in terms of what we can see around, around um, health and possibly health outcomes, um, those who deploy or who are, in, who are reservists in Class C, they look a lot more like regular force veterans and the challenges that I've described. Um, so women is another area that have generally been understudied. Um, part of that is because they've been a smaller group although I don't think that's a strong enough case to make for why they haven't been studied more. They should have been studied more, and they are being studied more now. Um, traditionally, in World War II population group, they made up about 5% of the population. So they were viewed as kind of a smaller subpopulation. Um, but now they make up um, I think 15% of the regular force and, um, a, a, and an increasing percentage of the veteran population, up around 14 or 15%. So, um, so, but the work that is being done is finding that, you know, not surprisingly, women have a different experience. We know that women have different healthcare experiences generally as well. So we shouldn't be surprised that, 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 that there, we're finding uh, differences and different kinds of challenges in that population. 
So I just showed you that they're at greater risk of suicide. Um, they're more likely to have served in the, armed for in the Air Force, not the Navy. They're more likely not to serve as long. That's to release in the 10 to 19 year period. They're also more likely to medically release. And um, so, um, so I don't have data to show exactly what that means. But, but my suspicion would be that um, would be that there might be differential musculoskeletal impacts between men and women in terms of um, in terms of um, how they might experience sort of the wear and tear of military service. But that's but that is conjecture on my part. Um, and they are more likely to experience a drop or loss of income at release. So, um, so this is also a priority in the new defense policy, in the new, new uh, strong, secure, and engaged policy. It's about increasing the percent of women um, who are uh, um, actively serving. I think from night, I think from their current level to um, 20 or 25 percent. So, um, so the whole thing around uh, recruitment and retention of women is a big policy priority. And, um, and, and, and an opportunity for us to understand more about um, military service women and the life after service so that we can do a better job at understanding and addressing their unique needs. So a uh, quick conclusion. Um, uh, I think that while most veterans will transition successfully and have a good well-being, um, it's clear, and we know pretty much for sure going back to 1998, that they have higher levels of chronic illness. That's chronic pain, hearing loss, musculoskeletal conditions, mental health conditions, and limitations in functioning. So let me just take a step back now. Let's go back to 1939, since I had the same job as Dr. Burke. And, and so what would I have said today if I was writing the paper? Well, I guess uh, Dr. Burke was right, I think, because we found that it's not mortality that's been impacted or appears to be linked to military service. Uh, mortality seems to be the same in the studies he did and the studies we did, not that much different. Um, but what we found when we looked at morbidity as well was that uh, conditions, um, like musculoskeletal conditions, the ones that don't kill you but make your life more challenging were much higher. So, um, so I'm not going to say that there's a, that, that, that there's a theory of pre-aging, but I will say that we were probably exploring the same problem. There's a good possibility that we were exploring the same problem. So, um, so veterans aren't biologically different. They wouldn't have a different age, age you know, they're, they're, they're not biologically different than other Canadians. But this issue around um, how veterans do in the life after service, I think it really causes attention to the bottom line, which is this life course and well-being perspective, which is I think we really have to pay attention, not just what happens in the military mission, but what happens 30 years after the military mission, that it really requires this kind of life course focus. And I'm sort of excited to say that more and more that is the focus. So if you look at the um, new Canadian defense policy, a very, very focused on what they call total health and wellness, which is something like the domains of well-being that I talked about here as well. So I really think this whole thing about a life course focus on military service and this, um, this idea of a comprehensive understanding of well-being in terms of what the expectations people will, be, will have around, around having a good life, um, that that's really an important focus from a policy perspective in terms of um, uh, what we should be doing um, uh, moving forward. So with those um, finishing comments. Um, I want to thank everyone for your patience and the opportunity to, uh, to share this with you today. Thank you.